Okay. You know, Kevin Chafin. Just so I can get the sound good, why don't you tell me your, your full name and your address and where we are right now, and then I'll know that the sound is good. My full name is Fleming Dubose. Okay. And, and the address where we are right now? Your house address? 4523 Ayers Road. A-Y-E-R-S Road. Now that's where I got into a problem because I, I said Ayers Road. Nobody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had to spell it. Yeah. And, and your full name? I just want to make sure I pick you up. Nella Dubose. Okay. Great. Um, so you didn't always live here. You used to live in Payne City. Is that right? Yeah, I, I come from Washington County to Payne City in uh, 1930, I think it was. 1930, yeah, that's right. And uh, when I went to work for the Bibb Company, uh, I was 17 years old, and I, I got sick with pneumonia. My dad moved away, and so I went off with him. And so finally, I told dad one day, I said, you know, I'm supposed to have a job down yonder in Macon. Uh, and so I come back down here, and there was a uh, and oversee over the number one mill where I work. I, that's, I work from Payne Mill over to number one mill, and then uh, he put me right back to work. Jimmy Grove, that was the overseer's name, fine man. And uh, from there, uh, my brother, he got a job somewhere else, got me a job, and so I went up there with him. But in 1933, I came back to Payne Mill, Payne City, and moved in. At that time, you would you would ask the superintendent see, uh, about getting a house. So he he gave me orders to get a house. See. And uh, I lived in several empty houses. Several houses were empty, so I chose. I moved a few times. But uh, I stayed there on the village and worked at the mill. And uh, I started to work at 10 cents an hour. What year was that? That was 1930, wrong about the fall of 1930. And that was at? Uh, and then when I went away, I came back in 1933. And I, I stayed there and worked all that time until night, until uh, 41 and a half years later. And then I retired, because she, re she retired just a little while before I did. And so we've been retired ever since and enjoyed every minute of it. Now, you were working at the pain mill or the bib mill? The, the pain mill, a uh, bib owned pain mill. Okay. There was a man, Mr. Payne, he, he used to own the mill. So he sold it. Uh, to build, I suppose, and uh, they built, there were some more houses built over there, and they filled them up with people, nice houses. Sick room houses, you could take, you could get, if your family was large enough, you would get six room. If it wasn't, you'd have three room. But they were nice, had uh, electricity, running water, a bathtub in the middle of the back runway, Suppose if one family used it, the other family. Most people, if one family used it, the other one didn't, according to who they were. Uh, some of them, some of them did. It was all right. They used a lot of soap and water. And then years later, years later, the company had contracted people to come in there and redo this bathroom, make a private bathroom for each house, each size, you know. And that was, that was good, much better too. Then you could uh, put heaters in there and warm them up. 
did your family move? Did you did you come here from a farm? Yes, I, I come. Well, I I was raised on the farm, but I went to uh, I went to work in uh, Malumba and a sawmill and a planing mill at Oconee, Georgia. It was a uh, Oconee Lumber Company. But I come from there here to Payne Mill. I come in on the top of a truck, way up there on top of it, laying up there on a mattress. It wasn't as pleasure it wasn't as pleasure as much pleasure riding up there as I thought it'd be when I when I told them that's where I wanted to ride. And uh, I never have rode a truck up there no more. But uh, I come on in here and later when I went to work. At that time, I had had an a, a appendectomy over in Sandersville, that's above Oconee, in Washington County. And uh, I didn't go to work here for, uh, I guess they decided that I was uh, able to work. So the doctor passed me up, see, and that's when they put me to work. Here, in the yeah, mill? At the mill, uh, for, for a dime an hour. And, uh, well. Now, was that the first time you ever worked in a mill before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was your job? Well, uh, I gathered up refuse from one place to another and hauled it out. Uh, I moved a lot of bobbins. See, they used bobbins over there in my department. Other, other end, they used cones. But this end, we used bobbins, and they used them to, uh, uh, they run the yarn off the bobbins and put them in a trough that ran down in a box. And these boxes had to be emptied, and then these boxes had to go, these, these box of bobbins, when we emptied them, had to take them back to another department for them to reuse them. And so that was mainly what I would do. And, uh, the section man, he got, he got to sending me to get all of his supplies from the supply room, and I learned, I learned uh, just about anything he wanted. I just knew what to go get. And then, uh, as time went on, I did different things, and finally, uh, I went out. The uh, my overseer told me that they wanted to, wanted to wanted to carry me to the superintendent to talk to me about taking a the policeman's job over there. So I did, and I stayed. What year was that? That was about probably about thirty six. So from thirty to thirty five. From there, you were working in doing different jobs yeah. in the bob in a room where they in which uh, room? Before before I went out out there, though I did uh, I did become the oiler, oiling up machinery, see, keeping it oiled, and then I didn't have to fool with the bobbers unless I just helped somebody catch up with them, and uh, from there. Uh, I come out on the village. I was a policeman out there. We had some people there that did. We had Jack and Ed, and then uh, Uncle William Hunt. He come along. He helped us out there on the village. We kept kept the village clean, kept the grass cut, and we pretended to do the plumbing. But we didn't have time to do a good job of that. No. So you didn't work in the mill at that point. You were working as a policeman outside the mill, in yeah. the village. Yeah, that was that was my job. I didn't go back in the mill until about six years or over the later. Chief of police. That's what it was. That's yeah. That's what Somebody it was. A chief of police. <laughs> they made you chief of police. I was a chief. Had a little jailhouse over there. Had a little jailhouse over there. We put him. We put a man in it one time. He was. He come down here from Barnesville to a ball game, and uh, he got a little bit intoxicated, and 
So my partner and me, we take him from the ball diamond up there and put him in jail. So when the truck they came on went left after the ball game, we brought him by the jail and got him out of jail. We got a little frightened right there because when we opened the door, he was laying back in there asleep. But we thought he was so hot that he probably was dead. But we got him out, and he woke up, got him on that truck, and we never had any more problem with him, sent him off. That's, that's all, that was all of that. And So who deputized you and made you into, a, into the chief of police? Um, we had, let me see now. I don't remember who deputized me. I think at one time during the strike, I was deputized by the Bibb County Sheriff. His name was Jim Hicks. And, uh, but anyway, as we went on with this, uh, my, my, my superintendent then, his name was uh, P.E. Finley Jr. And he gave me a letter to read. And he gave me a pistol about that long, you know, a shooting iron. Well, I take it and I went home and I read that letter. And the main thing I remember about it, I never forgot it. He says, remember, Fleming, it's always, it's better to uh, have somebody a drunk or a speeder, something like that, somebody had violated the law, they better have him escape and get away than to have a dead man on your hand. So I always remember that. I never, I never uh, used my gun. I never pulled it. In fact, after a, a few years, I quit wearing it at all. Just left it at home, went on about my business. How long were you the chief of police in Bibb City? About six years. Payne City. Payne City. Bibb no. City is in Columbus. Right, right. Now, uh, did you miss the mills? when you Did you miss working inside when you were on the outside? Well, uh, I kept thinking about that every once in a while. But you see, the NRA had come in, and then the people in the mill, they, uh, they worked eight hours a day. Well, I was the chief out there. I was... Uh, I was on duty all the time. Even called at night. Even if even if somebody wanted the law, they called me at night, see. And I'd go out and uh, try to be sensible and uh, do the best I could, quieting somebody down. If necessary, I would take him in, take him down to the Bibb County Jail, see. But. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't a hang up with me. I I wasn't uh, anxious to do that. If a man would listen to me, he would be all right. You, you mentioned the NRA. Do you, um, maybe you can talk to me about this too. How did the NRA change? The well, map? we we were working. Uh, the NRA happened in thirty three, right? Thirty thirty. Three or four, I don't remember. Thirty. And uh, working twelve hours a day and going home for lunch, thirty minutes, wasn't it? We went home for lunch. Uh, at that time, we was already working the day shift. They they worked till about. It's a long time for me to remember the exact hours. Probably went home about 11, twelve o'clock. Have uh, probably thirty minutes for dinner, which kept you moving. If you went home and ate a sandwich and hurried back, you, it was hard to do that in 30 minutes, but I guess that was about it. I don't remember. This was before the NRA? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was before the NRA. So, I remember hearing a man say, uh, we were talking about you know uh, going on the NRA and how many hours we would work, eight hours a day, and I remember hearing this man say, his name was Henry Lee Mullis, he said, he was always funny anyway. He said, well, I could stand on my head eight hours a day. <laughs> uh, 
that was a new concept of life for us. Because I had come off the farm, and she had come off the farm, the pits of the mill working, see. Of course, now, we were satisfied because we didn't know anything else. Well, it was better than the farm to me. So many, so many hundreds of thousands of people didn't even have a job. And we had a job at the mill. And one we, thing... We wasn't the only ones either. I mean, there was a lot of people with better education that we had that could not get a job. It was glad to get a job in the mill. Oh yeah, right there. yeah. There was there was there were some people. They probably uh, come to work with a collar and a tie on, you know. But that didn't last long because it was hot in there. But in later years, we had a president by the name of uh, Charlie Hertwig. President of what? The company, mm -hmm. the big yeah. company. And he uh, he worked up a plan and had the bib mills air-conditioned. This was in the 40s, I guess, right? That that did come on later. I may be getting a little ahead of myself, but <laughs> I don't... I'm That's not, okay. I, I'll remember where we are. We can yeah. go back. Don't worry but, about getting uh, ahead. Another thing, though, back in... Uh, 34, I think I, I think we had the strike in 1934. Well, I didn't strike. I had been out of a job for a long time. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, that a lot of people, thousands of them, was out of jobs. And so when I got the job here, yeah, I stuck to it. So when all these people run out, I stayed in. I don't care what nobody said. I said, this is my job. They gave me a job. I'm not going to just walk off. And uh, I said, this, the, these union people telling me what all they're going to do, I said, they'll have to do some of that before I, before I even know about it. Right now, they, it's talk. What were they saying? They were saying they was going to get us all big pay, get us big vacations, and... Uh, Yes, Eliminate work, going to make the company put on more people. You won't have to do as much work. And so many people believed it. Why do you think they wanted to believe it? Why did people want to believe that the union was going to do that? They wanted to believe it because they had never had anything any better than what they had. Working and on the farm, we called it from sun up to sun down. But up here, we call it from can to can't, or something like that. From what? Can to can't. So you can, can see or you can't. Oh. <laughs> a lot of people, still, instead of saying can until you can't see, they would say can to can't. Of course, we use that in the country, too. Can to can't. That was from, but the time is sun, just like, it's equal to the same thing as from sun up to sun down. And in 1934, during the strike, uh, my mother-in-law lived down at Camp Wheeler, old Franklinton, Georgia, just about nine mile out. Your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law and so father-in-law. So you were married then. Okay. Yeah, we we were married then. We married in uh, 31. So you got here, and in one year you met. Your wife, mm -hmm. and you got married. Well, I married. I met her uh, right after I come here, cause there was there was one boy out there that his name was J. W. Cobb, and uh, he had he has a sister uh, over here now. She's a a great person. A great Christian, her and her husband both, uh, in my church. We all in the church together, see. And she still lives here. But at that time, she was a little girl. But now she's a grown lady and retired. What's her name? Hazel Brickle. Hazel, Hazel Brickle. Brickle. Cobb. I, 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 Hazel I, Cobb Brickle. Hazel Cobb Brickle. Mm -hmm. They took some. Um, who was it? Mr. Uh, Pollard told me about her. But he, uh, she's is her husband sick right now. Mm -hmm. 
He's okay now. He, he, her mother was real sick and passed away. Her mother was real sick and passed away a, a few weeks ago. Oh, I know. I know what it is. She went away on a big trip, right? Yeah. She's on a big 18-day tour or something? She, she's I back. Missed, I missed him. Oh, yeah. she's back? She, she's back. Yeah, she's been back some time now. Oh, good. Oh, then maybe I could go talk to her. Then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she'd be fine. She just lived oh, down there just, just down... Young we are. Just below the Whitlocks. In fact, I don't know about that. <laughs> the Whitlocks, as you're going to see, yeah. the Whitlock, they live on Morgan Drive. Yeah. And the back of their lot backs into the Brickles, Hazel Brickles lot. But she faces Mackenzie Drive. Okay. So, uh, so you all live very close to each other, don't you? Mm -hmm. Some of you. Uh, so we were, let's see, where were we? Uh, in in thirty in back thirty two or four during the strike, uh, Mr. W. D. Anderson was president of Bill at that time, but uh, it worked around to his son Billy became president during the strike. Before, but he was oh. president during the strike. W. Was. W. Billy. Billy was, okay, the son of Mr. Anderson. The son, uh-huh, Mr. Anderson's son. Right. Now, he was president for years, see. But, uh, and so the union people were around talking about somebody comes and says, Hey, Flynn, you can't go in that mill. You know what? Them people come down here with pitch for it. They're going to run us all around here. I said, there ain't nobody gonna run me nowhere. I may have a pitch for it too. But at the same time, when we went to work, before I went in the gate, I walked up beside of the mill, and there come the president, Billy Anderson, on the inside of the mill, walking down, and I stopped. I said, Mr. Anderson, in the face of all of these threats we're having, can you can you uh, assure me or us? I said, I'm talking about myself now because my wife and me is ready to go in the mill line. These th people talking about what all they're going to do. That we won't get hurt. I've always admired his answer. He said, Mr. Debo, I would do anything in the world to guarantee you that, that nobody would get hurt. But I can't. I don't know what these people are going to do. He said, I'm just like you are. I just don't know. I went to work because I knew he was honest with me. That's one thing I thought. He didn't give me a big order. You do this or you'll, do, or you'll get fired. He was honest with me. I told my wife, I said, let's go to work. We'll handle it. There ain't nobody never come Were you walking out. together? Do you remember that? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, we were together. We were, won't go in where the door was unlocked. They couldn't open all the doors, all the gates like they had been. They had one. The rest of them were closed, so we'd come around up here. Were there a lot of people who were outside the yeah. gates? Yeah, yeah. What, what was that like? Could you describe that to me? Uh, it was... Uh, It wasn't pleasant. Friends believed what the union told them. And they was out there jumping up and down. I'm going to do this. We're going to do that. You better get yourself out here with us. These friends of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, friends of mine. And relative, but relative, they yeah, never, relative. my friends never threatened me no way other than wanting me to join them. Well, I just said no. No. You see, in the back of my mind, I knew I had done been out of a job for a good while. And so when uh, Murray Gardner was a superintendent, he gave me a job. And I went to work. The second time he went to work at the bill. I had been there before. He was a superintendent while I was there before. But in when 30, I come back. In 30, before uh, you got sick. Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was... He had given me the job in, in, in 1931. Mm -hmm. 
And then, uh, when I went to work over, back then in 31, when I worked at number one, I was a wine attendant over there, and she was a wine attendant. See, so this was all Bill, number one, number two, and Payne Mill. That was the three making Columbus, Portadale, Rental, several other towns, Forsyth, that was all Bibb, see. That was Portadale and Columbus where they were. Yeah. And uh So he gave you a job second time around, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He gave me a job second time around. That's where I got the oil and I mentioned why I go there I was was finally got the oil and machinery. That's where I got the oil and job. I so, went in on it. And I did it for years, and machinery. finally I got other jobs. I went out on as a policeman. And then when they, when I come back in the mill, they put me a uh, creeling in the picker room uh, in the open. Uh, wait a minute, in the twister room. Twisting room in the twister room. Yeah, and there they offered me a job out on the on the yard to be over the cotton department, to run the cotton department. That's when the cotton's brought in. That's where, that's where all raw material come in, the bales of cotton mm -hmm. come in, and and uh, we ship waste. Uh, I, when we had a, 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 a carload of, of waste, whatever it was, to ship off, I would, I would write it up and take it up to the shipping clerk, and he would write up the shipping tags and papers, give them to me, and I would seal the boxcars. Of course, he would, ship, he would keep the shipping papers and turn them in himself. What job, so were you doing the oiling job during the strike? Was that the job you were doing at the time? Uh, during the strike, now let's see. Yes, because I had come back here then. That was my, I was on my second time around then. Uh, so when I come back to the bib, I come back, went back to work at Payne Mill. And when I left before, I left from number one mill over there where I was a wine attender. Um, how did the, um, did people, did people come from outside to organize the the workers into a union. How, how did that? How did the whole union idea happen? Can you uh, talk about that? The the union the union rented a building downtown, and then they set out leaflets, and of course, uh, I wasn't the policeman right then, but later I come in when I did become the policeman. Uh, we uh, we wouldn't let anybody come in and distribute literature. It wasn't that I taken a personal interest in it. I was chief of police, and I was I had a job to do, and whatever it was, I did it. And. Uh, Were they distributing leaflets outside the mill or inside the mill? Mm -mm. No. They couldn't do that. Couldn't Later, I believe there was a law passed, the union people could pass out literature, but they couldn't go in the mill. And, uh, but it didn't ever affect me because if they passed it out, uh, they have to do it over yonder. See, they wouldn't come up to where I was standing and do it. Back in 34, did, so were they having meetings at this hall, at this at this building that they rented? Yeah, they they would have meetings, and they and they promised uh, everything in the book. Did Did you ever go to one of those meetings? No, I never did. So who told you about that? Friends. Mm -hmm. Friends, friends, uh, friends. They tell me about it. And they come on down there, come down there. You'll change your mind if you come down there. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, ain't nobody gonna change my mind. I make up my own mind. I made up, uh, that was when the union was first getting started in the South. 
Uh, years later, it probably got a little stronger in places. But uh, I never was. I never was a, a person to listen too much to the good things other people tell me. I had to know it, and I didn't know it. I was, I was, what I was making then was, you would say it might not be much, but I take care of myself and my family with it. Years later, maybe that caused me to uh, come out better years later. But this place down, this place down, town where these people met, mm -hmm. the company had ways of knowing what was going on, see, and I knew that too. How'd they know? They had, uh, some, some of the, some of the people Can told I say hello to you first? Yeah, I'll turn this off. The whole thing was settled, and most everybody went back to work. The ones who didn't go back to work, uh, they're the ones that really done a lot of crowing and... Uh, done a lot of what? Crowing. Uh, going? Getting up and hooping and hollering and carrying on. I'm gonna make you do this. I'm gonna do it. some of the company officials. Somebody they would talk bad to them. See, uh, uh, I don't know just how the what they didn't come back. I don't know about that. I just know they didn't come back. Did they leave town? Some of them did. What to hunt another job? Because they couldn't couldn't get a job nowhere in Macon. See. Because the union wasn't just at the hour mill, it was all over. They tried to get it all over. Uh, the union may be a good thing for some people, see. Even you might not like or understand the, the things that I, the, a lot of the things that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But it was the way I saw it then. And I never was able to change my mind over the years because the company, uh, they, they, uh, they played a good part towards the employees. Uh, I remember one time, a president, uh, Coma, what was his name? Hugh Coma. Hugh Coleman was president. So they gave, they gave everybody a raise. That was after I had, they had asked me from the cotton department if I wanted to go in the mill and learn a grinder, learn to be a grinder. The man said, I need three grinders. That meant to me they were picking up business. And he said, uh, he just told me a lot of things. And, and uh, but after I got in, I did take it. Then uh, this uh, president, Coma. Hugh Coma. No, it wasn't Donald? Hugh. Huh? Don Col Donald Coma? No, it wasn't. I thought it knew would forget his name. I knew when he went to college. Well, Mr. Coma, I said that. I gave a raise, and just a few weeks later, he gave another raise. And his reason, he said, the employees made us more money than we've ever made, so we're going to give them some of it back, give them some more of it. They give us a raise, then give us another raise. And we was happy. And uh, then... Uh, I left the yard. One of the one of the boys inside. He went out and take the job that I left to come in. Uh, 
handling the cotton, putting up cotton, figuring up the cotton, had to make your reports every day. And I had a man there to help me do anything I'd done. I had other men out there could do a lot of things. Did um did 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 colored folks work in the in the yard too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah they did. You worked colored people entirely. I was I was working out there when when their wages went to a dollar hour. I didn't do it. I didn't have that authority, but my company they raised the wages for everybody. Nobody would make less than a dollar an hour. I think that's right. And from that on, as the years come, raises come on. And uh, and when I come on up and retired, well, I retired in 74, 1974, October. And I've enjoyed it. I've never missed uh, anything. I'm just happy. When I, about the first several years that I retired, I'd fish every day or every other day or two days, twice a day or just any time I wanted to go, I went. Only thing I had to do, I had to quit fishing on Wednesday afternoon. Because that was prime meeting day, Wednesday night. And I had always had the best intentions of uh, coming home early so we could go to prime meeting. But over there, I would look at my watch and it'd be too late. I couldn't go. I'd done fish too long. So then yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to kind of cut down on my Wednesday afternoon fishing. But I fish Wednesday morning. We caught fish too, catching bass. I was fishing Around for bass. Here? Yeah, yeah. Lakes. Tob Tobisovsky was a lot of. This is good fish over there. Still some good fish over there. Still good fish. I haven't been in a good while, but I want to get back. My son has a place over there on the lake with a a beautiful dock and all of that Ooh. down there. Yeah, pontoon boat and. Uh, but I'll get back down there some of these days. But it was it was just it was just uh now we had we had uh the company to build a swimming pool down there. And and uh, that was fine for all of the all the people of the village. There was times when grown people, young people, children and all had a shallow in where children could go. And my superintendent, uh, Prentice Finley, right on, told me whatever my crew of men was doing, that I was with them, whenever that swimming pool opened, morning, evening, or night, he wanted me to be there. And I was there. At the swimming pool? Swimming pool, yeah. With your men? No. no. My men, they worked. But I was there. To, we didn't want an accident. We didn't want a drowning. I never had one. We might have had some close calls, but uh, it never really happened. But uh, we had some high school young men there. There was uh, some of them was real famous football players because they played for the the school, you know, and they and they made a record for themselves. Nub Welch was one of them. He was a uh, he was a lifeguard out there. Other boys was a lifeguard out there. I didn't interfere with them. I didn't go down there telling them what to do. That wasn't my duty. My duty was to be there and keep my eye on so, everything. Sounds like a number of times in your work history, they called on you to have some sort of a, to be a guard or a policeman or a lifeguard, to have, to keep be on, on keep watch. Order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they they got a contract with this uh, with a man over here, and they built a swimming pool in the winter time. And he he told me he taken the contract at a very good price for the company, just something to keep his uh, people at work during the winter. And that's why he did it in the winter time because. 
just to keep them working. Chances are he didn't make little much money himself. He done it for his people, and it, it was good. So he you done had the, an indoor swimming pool and an outdoor swimming pool. No. A what? I guess I didn't understand. Forget that. So you, they were building a pool in the winter. That's when they built. They built the pool in the winter. Yeah. He, summer. He, dug, summer. he dug the place. They went and dug this place out. I see. It's warm here in the winter, so you can be outside. Oh, they yeah. they moved us and poured the cement, and uh, they had a they had a drain from the bottom of it, and you, uh, we wouldn't ever let anybody have that plug taken out. Uh, well. We wouldn't let any children be down here because if that thing happened to come out, he would, he would pull one in it. But we never allowed a child down there when it was open. Um, I'm going to stop this for one moment. I wanted to get back to the 30s a little bit because that's the period of time. Back that, in the 30s. Back to the 30s because that's uh -huh. the period of time that my project is focusing on. Um, what were the conditions like working in the mill during the Depression, and that's when you started working. Yeah. Uh, and if you it could was, add anything, please do. It was, uh, there were so many people that didn't have jobs back then, until when I come over here and, and got the job and went to work, uh, one fella he kind of offended me one time, but I told him what it was like to be out of a job. So he said I didn't know anything. He worked there, working three days a week. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I stopped for a little bit. I almost <laughs> turned around and went back and wouldn't walk with him. But I knew him, and uh, he just I just said, that's okay, that's the way he feels. I was speaking of people out of a job. I knew everywhere it was like that. And and he had a job. He wasn't making much, but he had a job. What about in Payne City? Payne, well, he was, that's Payne City I'm talking about. Because mm -hmm. I was here and he was here. Uh, at one time, uh, I guess this was in the 30s too. Our company come down to working uh, three five hour days a week. Now I happened to be an oil at that time and I oil machinery. So I didn't lose five hours. I got 15 hours a week. But my wife, she did lose five of that. They made 10 hours most people got 10 hours a week because they have to rest one of them. Uh, at that time, it was so rough, the company realized it, and so they so canceled. So they had cut back everybody's hours, that's it? Yeah. People were working very little? Yeah, was working very little, 10 hours a week. That was, is this after the NRA? Mm -mm. No. Before. That was, that was uh, wait a minute. Back the no, that was after the NRA. That was after the NRA. So people were making more money, right? But less hours. Was they that? made. They made. Yes, they made uh, a little more money. In fact, twelve dollars. It made people get twelve. Well, they used to make ten dollars for about fifty or sixty hours. Then they made twelve dollars for forty hours. But then, but they weren't working forty hours, were they? Mm -mm. But they didn't get paid. They got paid for 40 hours if they worked 40 hours. If they worked 10 hours, they got paid for 10 hours. That was very small. The company realized it was rough on the own people, so they suspended any rent. They didn't collect any rent from us. And, uh, well, the rent wasn't much anyway, about a dollar and a half. According to, where, where, according to where two people lived in two rooms, two rooms was just 70 cents a week, three rooms was a dollar and a half, six rooms was three dollars a week. How many rooms did you have? 
Well, I had times I had two rooms <clears throat> until we had a, a baby born, and then I went and uh, told my superintendent, he was in charge of the house, you see, that I would like to get that three-room house down there. It's empty, and uh, I need it. Pick up a piece of paper. There you are. Give that to your policeman out there. Then when I got to be a policeman, see, if anybody got a house, he would give them a paper and they would bring it to me. I mean, I would take them in. So the policeman was in charge of where everybody lived? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. At that time, I was in charge of all of the housing. And, and uh, the policeman who helped me was Mr. Cobb. That was Hazel's father, Hazel Brickle's father. Had he been a policeman at one time before you? Well, let's see. Now, he was he was an electrician in the mill, and he, uh, he policed on the weekends. That's the way he did his. And uh, so we worked together perfectly. Good. We got along good. No problem. So d right bef so during the, th in the mid-30s, let's say, people were getting more money, but they were working less hours, right? For a now, while. They got more money for what they did. Uh, they appro appropriate to pay per hour for what you work, which were more than they did get before the NRA. But uh, it wasn't a huge amount. No, the main thing about NRA was... Uh, it was great, as long as you made... The hours, you know, like uh, instead of working. You got the same, maybe the same pay a little more for eight hours that you did. It had been formerly got for 12. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, a lot of time we would we would be on our porch at the house when the eleven o'clock shift got off, and they would come by and go home, and we worked on the morning shift. But later, as a different job that paid more, and they wanted me on another on another shift, I taken it. Like the cotton department, when I taken over the cotton department, that paid more. Then I made when I was in the twist room, creeling. I was a head creeler. Could you tell me, I, I've heard people have told me about the stretch out around the same period of time that we're talking, um, you know, about 33 or so. Yeah. Did they, uh, they have that here in, in, in your mill? book. I got the feeling that the, that well, I could I read that the um, the mill created a wonderful. It seems like a wonderful environment. They did. Now. Could you describe that to me? Uh, Hazel Brickle. Be the I mill. could tell you. Why is that? But Hazel Brickle was in it. She was part of it. Well, she was a member of the Girl Reserve when I got there. When I got there, see, and. Uh, this boy, I told you, this Hazel's brother, J.W. Cobb, he told me, he said, I want you to just sit out here on the grass now, and you pick out the one in there that you want a date with. And it's about 20 or some of them, so we sat out on the grass. And that's why when their meeting was over, yeah. Girl Reserve, see, they all had blue uniforms and white collars and so forth. So they come by. And so he said, just look at them all now. Tell me which one. So I said, that was right on them. Second from right on them. Oh, yeah. He said, well, I know them all. So he lived and he knew them all. So he fixed it up. So we uh, we had a date. And uh, from there we got married. Mm -hmm. Now, when you would go out, so when people were socializing, did you stay in the village when you were socializing or did you go out of town? In the village? Mostly in the village. Now, some people, some people, uh, the company had a, a social worker. And the social affairs, they had a lot of things that 
for the people to be entertained with. It wasn't that we had to go here, but most people went because they enjoyed it. Now, once in a while, somebody else here would decide he he wanted to go out somewhere else. Well, once in a while, somebody would say, Hey, you know I slipped off last week? I went to the dance. Well, now, he slipped off. He meant he went to the dance and... Uh, he didn't tell anybody. He, he thought maybe somebody in the social circle might not like it if they knew he went. And so we just kept our mouth shut when somebody told us something like that. To the dance meant it was a different dance out of the village? That... Uh, most of the dances that they were talking, he was talking about, I don't say all of them, a lot of them was. Uh, from, from the standpoint of uh, maybe the social worker, a lot of us, we thought they were nice people, you know, because they had drinking and all that. Because these were public dances, you know, not not something friends got up. And... But the, the, uh, the swimming pool, that a lot, a lot of the children could go down there and everybody knew where their children were. And there was somebody down there to look after them. And uh, the later years, we praise it now more than we did then. Because now we... Praise the village. Yeah, the village activities, yeah. We think it was great. Right then, we probably uh, felt like it was... Uh, we didn't feel like it was the greatest thing, but now we know it was. Our children, uh, they, they're thankful that they came from Pain City because they have lasted friends from there. And when we had a reunion, the first time we got together and had a reunion for the younger, I say the younger people, our sons who are in the 50s, uh, but they saw each other, some of them you know, saw each other the first time in, since they'd finished high school and left and gone to different states. And it was the greatest thing in the world to see them, you know, looking at the name tags and recognizing each other. And those were young people that had, was born there. And the fathers would get out and roll them around in the little buggies together, you know. Then the first birthday party they had, uh, they were all there. And the second on up, you know. And then when they started school, they started school together. They went to grammar school at Bellevue together and then they uh, finished high school together, Lanier and Miller, what it was. Then. So the, 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 there was a school, there were schools in the village? No, uh-uh. Uh -uh. Yeah, no school there, no but school. we went, most of them come right up here to Bellevue. There's a uh, right up here over the hill, there's a school on the right at, at the stoplight of a Bellevue school. Most of them went to school right there, unless it's Bill overflow and ask some of them to go down follow to Pearl Steve and they did that sometime. But most of the people that you that you it's not, that you spent your time with were right there. The people mm -hmm, you worked mm -hmm. with them, you played with them. Oh, they just yeah. had one big family yeah. over there. We had a ball team there and everybody enjoyed it. Be surprised to know how many people went to the ball game. Didn't have to go, but that's what they wanted to do. And uh, uh, we we mothers we uh, we looked after each other's children, you know, so to speak, because they were all playing together around the village, wind up at different one's house, and so we kind of looked after each other's children. Did you and have enough? Did you have free time? It sounds like you were working a lot of hours. Well, I work uh, when the mill were on full time. A lot of time they was on slow time, not like I mentioned a while ago, 10 or 15 hours a week. But sometimes it would be three or four days. Well, uh, we, we, uh, we cope with it. We cope with it all right. And uh, people learn how to handle it. And they had a community house and an auditorium over there. And uh, in the community house they had the social meetings, cursors and women's club and 
Uh, but y'all have, y'all have been in this club there for a while, didn't you, before you met, built the men's clubhouse? Yeah, I had that auditorium, I think. An auditorium. But in the auditorium, they had, uh, at one time, they had movies there, and so you didn't have to go off to go to a movie. And uh, they had uh, Sunday school there because there were so many people. Oh, see, we didn't have cars, and we had no way to, to get you can't, different places you, to Sunday school. You so can't we, hardly understand when people don't have cars. Over there, there was, there was always about 500 people or a little more lived there. One probably two or three, three or four cars on, over the whole town. I remember I had two telephones. In the whole town? Mm-hmm. This is three. Who? The superintendent and uh, Mr. Cobb and uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Why did those three have phones? Um, well, they, I guess they could afford them. <laughs> well, they didn't. Well, they just they just bought a phone. One of them, he was a mechanic, and he worked on cars, so he he made a little extra money, so he put it in his telephone. And uh, there's a there's a lot of things that don't exactly come to mind right now, but. We can sit down and think and go back up. But she was talking about the piece work a while ago. Yeah, let's get back to it. Instead of working by the hour, she worked by running wind, I see, running yarn by the pound. And she'd, she'd run up a whole big box here, and they'd take it around and weigh it and uh, give her credit for the how much. And, the, and all these tickets were taken up and turned into the office, see. And that's where she got paid so much per pound, so much per hundred pounds. And if she missed a ticket or two, sometimes she did, she was I didn't draw as much as I was supposed to. So she would go back out there and look and she'd find one or two or more of her tickets that were somebody well, failed I'd have to get. Duplicates of them and I'd care about that. See and she had a duplicate. Have theirs, well, they'd recognize mine, so. And they and they would straighten it out. They would. And uh Was uh, that now, But yeah. but this piece work you had to work. You could go up and stand there and look at it and look over and talk to somebody or go over yonder and talk to him or come back. If you did too much of that, the boss would come by and say, You don't make production. You don't make production. You have to make production. Well, if you didn't, uh, if they couldn't put you on another job or something else, they might have to lay you off. And there was such a thing that I heard of. Uh, I heard a man one time, he told a person, he said, you better do a better job over here because a barefoot man at the door out there wants your job. Someone and, told you that? No, he told somebody else that. I've had him tell me that. But the he thing about it, what we knew, got the door and sure enough, there'd be somebody out there. There were people out there lined up, job, so lined up, person. wanting a job. When I went there to get the job that I talked about getting, we was there's a line of us standing there. There was a man come up there and just elbowed me out of the way and he got in front of me. And you know what? I got to thinking. This man may be go uh, this man may be going after the job that I'm going after. If he don't have a one and he gets it, I won't get a job. I reached and got him. You get back here behind me. Don't you get in front of me no more now. <laughs> I'm going ahead of you. And I, I take my place back. I got the job. I don't know what happened to him. I didn't see him no more. If he either got the job, he wouldn't see me no more. <laughs> You see, I got the job. And my, what people might say was uh, maybe a little brash or ugly act, I don't know. That might have paid off for me, I don't know. But that's the way I felt and I did it. I would have felt guilty if I hadn't did it. Yeah, especially if I didn't get a job. What, what year was that when that happened? That was in uh, 33. 
1933 when I come when I was coming back here. Um, did did people talk about uh, that that strike? How, did it just start like that, or was it slow building? A talk, 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 talk. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a lot of talking. Actually, people never had anything hardly. And these union people come in and tell them. When you say people didn't have anything, what do you mean? They didn't make anything. Nobody had a anything, car. You know. Why couldn't you save anything? How come you couldn't save any money? You had to have it to live on. You had to have. You had to have. You had to have food. And uh, you just you couldn't go and buy any kind of clothes you wanted. You had to go buy something you could wear. And uh, you save back a little money to get, uh, this was during the Depression, you know, and it was like that elsewhere, really, in the South. I don't know about anywhere else, but in the South, I know it was. I think it was like that all over the country. And, uh, it was, well, it was ever, it wasn't my company doing that uh, against other companies making a lot. Nobody made it. We saved back a little I, bit. I'm, I'll be 78 years old in October, and uh, I remember a lot of things back then. We didn't talk about how poor we were. We just knew we couldn't, uh, so many things we couldn't do. You were saying we saved back a little change to get ice with each day, I think it cost a nickel. Because then you didn't have uh, no refrigerator, no fridge there, you had just an ice box to put a block of ice in, you know, keep the food cold. And uh, if we spent that foolishly for something else, we didn't have no ice with them without ice. And when our children come along, and uh, we had to have that ice in to put in that ice box. We didn't have an electric ice box like we've got now. See, I could take this one out here and roll it out and put a new one in here any time I wanted to. But then, wouldn't do it. And then I had to struggle to put ice in the box. Um, did you? Where did you buy your your food from? Was there a company store that you bought it from? Was there? No. There was another company store down for another company. We never we never was into that. Them people, if they ever bought from the company store, they didn't ever draw another check until they was gone. But we we didn't have that. We bought groceries wherever we wanted, and uh, paid for them and get them home, and that's it. That was a better way to do it, I suppose. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Our company was, overall, overall we had it good. We might not have realized it then, but as the years come on by, we can look back and see. See, I come off the farm to this place down here in Oconee where I worked in the lumber mill and the planing mill. Then I come up here. I thought it was a great thing that I didn't have to be out in the rain, in the freezing weather, and the uh, hot weather. I wasn't in the sunshine. I was used to all that. But when I come up here, I went to work. Other people, I hear people sit around, people get around, they talk about how much work he was having to do, and uh, he didn't like that. Well, I thought, these boys never have been out on the farm where I come from. And uh, so that's the way it went. Um, so you were saying how these people didn't have anything. You were saying the people who were um, talking about striking. The, the working. The working people. The working people. They didn't have anything. Didn't have any money. They get the, They draw their. They draw their. They used to pay off over there in cash. Put that little brown envelope. At at bib. At the bib. Yeah. Bib. And they would put the amount and your name on envelope. Is that how you got paid? I did for a while yeah. until the until the company started writing checks. For what was that like? Was it once a week? Um, what was once, getting you paid? Once, like? once a week. When was that? Once a week. That would be uh, Thursday. Pay, payday was most always on Thursday. What, and everyone got paid at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
paymaster up in the mill. Hazel used to, she used to keep up, and she was paymaster for a while. Hazel did everything. Hazel, Hazel Cobb, you talking about? She used to do everything. I don't know what the, I don't know what the superintendent and the rest of them used to do, but Hazel used to run everything. Um, one funny thing to me is I think back, uh, uh, the people, like when payday came, it might be their day to rest, you know, to be out or something. But they came back and got that chick, and they'd always come back dressed, just as my grandmother said, dressed fit to kill. They'd wear their best. And I always wonder why they did. Maybe I did too. <laughs> I just remember they did. And, uh, oh, they'd have come in with their coats on with the fur collars on them, you know. Maybe they were dressed to go to town, you know, and just came by and picked up the check. But, uh, but there was no way to go anywhere unless to go up here and catch. It used to be a streetcar, and then it got to be the bus. City bus. And all like that. Um. It was way years later before people began to buy a car. Different one to buy a car. This is when Roosevelt, we're talking about a period of time when Roosevelt's in office. Uh -huh. What did you think of him? I thought. I loved him. I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. I did. Had one man that worked in the company there. He appeared, he said he hated Roosevelt. But he got just, Roosevelt helped him get just as more money that I did. But still, I never could understand it. But I never did, I never did get in an argument with him. But Roosevelt, I know, it come out years later that the president had a lot of side things going for himself. Well, that was his. But what he done for the world, our part of the world, he put the people to running. Uh, he cut out this 11, 12, 10, 11, 12 hour days. He gave them eight hour days. And it's still standing. And uh, he uh, he started Social Security, which has grown. It's grown now from what it was then. Started off at penny on the dollar, and now it's about pretty close to seven and a half cent on the dollar. And uh, well, that pays off better. He just he just did. Uh, he just did a lot of things that looked like nobody else ever thought of, but he, he got it done. Did people talk about Roosevelt in the village? Yeah, loved him, loved him, except one man. Did P you know, I, I hear that people used to write him letters. Did you know that in those days? Did you uh, ever know anybody that wrote Roosevelt or Mrs. Roosevelt a letter? I don't remember it, but I know a lot of people said they wish there was some way they could tell him how they appreciated what he had done. And, but most people thought if I write him a letter, somebody else would intercept it and tear it up and throw it away. Roosevelt won't ever get the message. That's what people thought. The, the truth is that he and his wife, they got more letters than any other president ever in history, even today, I believe. And he did get the letters. They're all preserved yeah. in Washington in an well, that's great. That was during, uh, you know, World War II. No, no, no. Wasn't it? No, it was right during the 30s, right? Well, so during, it was during the time 30, we were talking 33, about. 33, 34. Mm -hmm. You see, we were the recipients of a lot of this. See, we come out from this 10, 11, 12 hour day and night. But we were coming to eight hours. Died. Eight hours. Why, well, he's just like she said, one man, Mullis. He said, well, he could stand on his head eight hours a day. What did he mean? <laughs> he meant he meant that. Uh, anybody he, could work eight hours, but. He meant uh, anybody can work eight hours. He don't have to. Uh, just look. Why, well, we make it 12 hours, now I make eight? What's that? And I'm making I make as much or more for eight hours than I did for twelve. 
what do you think Roosevelt was trying to tell people about themselves? What, what do you think he was doing for people? Uh, he, he insisted for people to join the Union. Roosevelt did. He did, did. That's that's the first that's the first president that ever uh, actually come out and said, "Get yourself in a union." And some of the some unions would go in and call so many people to join and shut a mill down. And the mill authority would say, "We can't pay this kind of money." And so we'll shut the mill down. The, the owners would say. I give you a job. You work for me. But if you join the union, gonna tell me how to run my business, I'll shut the mill down. Then the government come in with a law that if anybody shut his mill down, they would tax every spindle in the mill so much tax on it while it was stopped. So much tax on it while it was stopped. Now the mills were shut down for a while, weren't they? I mean, mm -hmm. When they were shut down for a strike, that that didn't occur. But when somebody just shut the mill down to keep from talking to the negotiator with the union, that meant if it was shut down for good, the you know, the government come in see and and uh, put a put a tax on each spindle. I had to pay so much tax on it, and so that was, that would hurt the owners. So then they decide some of them decided to negotiate. Now, during the strike in '34, was that it was in September or was it in in August here in town? But did it start early in the summer or in September? I really it was don't September. don't remember, but uh, I think it was I think it was in the warmer part of the weather. Well, it must have been around As I time. understood it, there in a lot of towns all over, there was a lot of violence during these strikes. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, we had a lot of threats along then, but I don't know of anybody. I don't know why anything everybody ever got got hurt down here. They did other places. Do you remember anybody? No. Uh. uh I don't. I don't know anybody. I know that um, Eugene Talmadge. You remember him? Yeah. What did you think of Gene Talmadge? Oh, uh, I wasn't. I wasn't on his side. He was. He was a, a big, loud, talking. And uh, sometimes he'd get his foot in his mouth, then you he was trying a whole lot to get straightened out. But uh, I never did, uh, I never did think Talmud was one of the finer people. And uh, his son, then he come on in. Herman. Yeah, Herman. So he tried to take the governorship over. And I thought that was terrible. I thought that was terrible. Now, Gene Talmadge apparently sent in the National Guard to a lot of these mills. Yes, he did. Do you did remember that? that? Yeah, yeah. Did he send them here? No, but he sent them to Porterdale. Porterdale, a mill up above you, up here above here. And, uh, well, he said he didn't do it. He said Colonel Lindley Camp did it. But he was the governor. We knew he was the governor. And, uh, and it, it was bad what they went in there and did. But somebody went up, somebody went up. Lindley Camp come into Porterdale. Who was Lindley Camp exactly? That was an adjutant general of the uh -huh. National Guard. He come down there. I understand. I wasn't there, see. 
But I've been told then, so many people told me the same thing. Said that head man of that National Guard come down there and give them people that the bill would actually hire them. Give them so many hours to get out of town. And they had to go. Just like that. Broke that up. Brought his men in there too. I think he did bring his uh, men in there to see if they were gone. And uh, These were the picketers. Mm -hmm. These are the people come in here and they I understood they were rough on, on uh, people who were picketing. And so when Colonel uh, Landley W. Camp, he broke that up. That was, that was what I was told. I was told, uh, well, I was told that so many times, that's why I remember the name Lindley W. Camp and who he was, because actually I, I, I probably didn't know. These people told me. So what about what about what ha what happened right around here around around the gates in your mill and all those pi all those picketers? You you mentioned before that that there are some people and families that were split up. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me more about that? What she meant is some one person would be a, a family. This you know, he said, I believe the union's right. I'm gonna stick to the I'm gonna stick to the union. Another one says, You can't do that. We work for the company all of our lives. We're gonna stay. We're gonna we're gonna work for the company. Who's gonna feed us if we don't work? He said, the union man. He said he's gonna make them give us so much money that we have everything. But it didn't happen. See. And then, then families would get mad with each other, you know. That's why it said it was okay. But yeah, at that time there was a lot of hard feelings uh, between families sometimes. Because when people got married, left home, you know, that was a different family then. Maybe they saw it different, and uh, so things like that did happen. So, how many days do, were, were, were there a lot, did lots of people go down to stand on these lines with the, with the picketers and the signs? Yes, there were. Yes, there was a lots of them. But the people who didn't didn't pick it, I didn't. Uh, my my mother and father-in-law lived down at Camp Wheeler, down at Franklin. I mentioned that a while yeah. ago. Well, we went down there, and we read in the paper or got word. Look, wasn't no we telephone. Didn't have war, you know. I said, let's, let's wasn't no Mars. telephone <laughs> then. Got on the little MDS train and we rode down. Yeah, there was a train run from town from here to Dublin, MDS. We could get on a bus over there, or a streetcar. I think it was a bus. It was fair finally went up from a nickel to a dime, and then on up. We could get there and ride down to the terminal station, get on a train for 11 cents a piece, and, and ride the train out to Camp Wheeler. What? And so we we got... So why did you decide to go there? Her mother and father lived there. I insisted. <laughs> she insisted to go. You and all this, uh -huh. all this, I didn't this, want him to get into a problem. This. I knew I wasn't going out of the house, but I didn't want him to get into a problem. Well, with the other stuff, with she the wanted, she wanted, me, she wanted to get me out of it because I was going to go out there and all them people going to do I something. I was going to go out there and single-handedly strangle all of them, yeah, he he which, <laughs> which now I realize there wasn't no such thing in me doing such as that because I couldn't. And so we caught the train and went down there. And then we read in the paper. There wasn't no telephones, you know. We read the paper that the bill was going to See, they shut down for a few days in the heat of all of this. And they uh, was going to start back up a certain day. Well, then we come home and we were here. Now, my, my folks, my in-laws, they begged us not to do it. Don't go, don't go. You might get hurt. You might get, you don't know what them people are going to do. Well, I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do either, but I'm going. With a raised fist. <laughs> yeah. And so I come up there. That is, that is the day that I, I spoke a while ago of seeing young Billy Anderson, the president, and when I spoke to him, and he answered me in such an honest manner, I said, I'm going to work. That man... 
That man had been honest with me, and I'm going to work. So did you go to work that day? Yes, sir, right then. Did you go to work that day, too? I think she did. I think we were both out there talking to him Almost through the right. fence. So when he told me that, I said, let's go to work. Now, when you were talking to him, could you actually see all the strikers at the same time that you saw him? Yeah, I could see them out yonder. Hooping and hollering and, and uh, threatening. <laughs> but the thing is... Were there friends of yours that were on the lines? Well, some of them joined in with them. See, they come in from other meals, and then uh, our strikers would join in with them. Uh -huh. I don't think I was... Our, our strikers uh, from our meal, they'd usually try to talk to us, you know, talk us into it more than threaten us. That particular day, we were worried about what was going to happen when we got off at 11 o'clock that night. That's when that was second shift that you were working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we uh, got out, we were at home, not a word from anybody. They might have been mild one of but not to us. Now, you mentioned before that you were deputized mm -hmm. during the strike? Yeah. What, how, how did they do that? Uh, the company had a, a plant down at Reynolds. And the company said, we didn't know what they said, but they come around to a lot of us one night and said, we want to go off on a trip. We want a bunch of men to go with us. And don't tell anybody where you're going. We don't going. want nobody to know where we're going. You don't know where you're going, but I'll tell you when we get down yonder. And uh, so I was one of them said, I'll go. Now, so, is this during, this is still during the strike. You're working, yeah, but other yeah. people are. This was during the strike. No, I wasn't working then. We was out. So they came to your house. But where they were going, where they were going, yeah, where they were going to go to, I got paid a regular hour with work, and uh, you got paid what you usually got, or you got paid more. I got, I got paid. Uh, well, I got paid for more hours down there, but the same amount I made up there. Uh, one thing I never did complain about it, but I was dissatisfied that some other people here made more money than I did. So he got a lot of money for going down yonder. Well, I didn't make that much, so I just got what my job called for. Well, he got what his job called for. And, but they told us that there'd been threats that the Union, they, they claimed they had some flying squadrons get in a truck, a bunch of cars, and go in somewhere and jump out like that and, uh, and just gonna shoot everybody up. No. Who was the flying squadron? You that was the Union people. The Union people. They Did you ever see them do that? No. Nope. But we went down there at Pottersville, Reynolds, to prevent that from happening. We all had guns, and they had bales of cotton put out like this. And we sat behind them bales of cotton for hours. And every time we heard a car roar, somebody said, watch out, watch out. And we'd watch him. We had somebody posted up the road to check all the incoming people. One of the men up the road one day, he stopped a man that owned a lot of land out there, had a load of peanuts in his car or truck. So this walk man walked up there and said, where are you going? He said, I live down here. I'm a farmer down here. I got a load of peanuts here. I'm going to deliver them. And that man talked to her. He looked down. That man had a, he had a sawed-off shotgun right there on it. See, he was driving. So he was sitting there talking to him, and that sawed-off shotgun was right on him. That man said, go ahead, mister, and do whatever you want to do. Never heard anything else about it. See, the man lived down there. We really didn't, shouldn't have been asking people where we're going because they weren't going to come in there and one at a time and like that. They were going, they were so, well, if they were going to come in there, they were going to come in with a, a whole crew of them at one time.
So did they come? Nope. Never did. Because they knew they were down there, though. See, there was a lot of talk about, we're going to do that. We're going to do this to you. But it never happened. Now, we didn't ever have the problem of somebody uh, bothering our house or doing anything to us. But if somebody knocks at the door, you made sure who that was before you let them in. You asked who it was. This was during that period of time. Yeah, yeah during that Not period. Not all the time. Not all the time. No, just during that period of time. We were very careful. and uh, No, uh, all the time, other than that, we uh, always could go to bed and leave our doors unfastened. Nobody ever worried about that. Nobody bothered anything. Yeah, we used, to, we used to go to bed at night with the doors wide open. Just, just hook the screen. No, so none of the the flying squadrons didn't come to the mill right here in Payne City. Uh 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 uh. Never did. It's always threats. We're gonna do it, but they never did. So they organized differently here. They did it with leafleting and talking mm -hmm. to people. And they talked and talked. And they told people what all we're gonna we're gonna get for you. And the people, the people. Uh, they felt like that they, some of them felt like I had been down all my life. Uh, I, want to, I want to get up on top. And the union says, I'll make you, I'll put you all of you on top. That union man's name was Ralph Gay. Is he in town? I don't know wherever he went. I don't know, don't know where in the world he is. But that was his name. Did he work in the mill too? No. He, he just came. He was a union man that come here for that purpose to unionize the mills. Now, did they, how'd they get rid of him? What happened to him? Uh, all of his plans failed, and uh, he left town. He I left town. People had to finally go back to work to eat because the union wasn't supporting them as they promised. Yeah, the union, union told them, strike. We see that you get plenty of food. Did they get relief? No. One man told me he he was tired of going down to get a sack full of potatoes. Got a little relief. He probably got a sack full of potatoes. Where did you of meat. get, where did, were you being paid when the when the strike was, when the plant was shut down? Uh-uh. So where'd you get, how'd you eat? Uh, um, a store we could buy groceries from and charge it to pay it later. Yeah, we bought, we got groceries from a, a store down we there. We didn't have the money to go right over the here. railroad to another place and buy And he was, and he was a good car. man, so we didn't buy, well, we, we tried to keep it down because it was hard to pay, but we intended to pay it. And so when we went back to work, well, when when they take me down yonder to Pottersville to Taylor Mill, they come back, they gave me a check. So I went and paid him up right then. And, uh, Did and they ever call you to come out and uh, patrol the neighborhood right in the village? No, but other people were doing that while I was down there. They were deputized in the village. Uh -huh. And when we got down there, the sheriff down there in Taylor County, he come down there and Debra, he made sheriffs out of all of us. How did he do that? Was it like a ceremony? Yeah, he just talked, you raise your hand, and he debitized us, do your duty in Taylor County, and in the community of Taylor County. Well, some of them, later they talked about, I'm a deputy sheriff in Taylor County. Well, I said, uh, well, I was debitized just like you were, but when I left down there, come back up here, that, <laughs> I'm there, I'm, I feel like that I'm not a sheriff because I, I was sworn in to do a specific duty for the beer manufacturing company. The sheriff, he wasn't, not the sheriff, he was just backing them up. And uh, so that's, that's the way that went. I forgot about being a deputy down there. You just remembered? Mm -hmm. I just remember. Now, before you were talking a little bit, you know, we've been talking a little bit, bit about attitudes people being down, people yeah, being up. Yeah. What do you, I've heard this term thrown around a lot, lint head. Lint head? 
Uh, years ago. You know what? Let's let your wife tell us first. Yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah, a, yeah. tell me about a lint egg. Who said that? Well, I don't remember where it first came from, but people uh, that that didn't work at the mill, uh, they would sometimes uh, throw off on people that worked in the mill and call them lint heads because never the mill I worked at do, do I remember it, but uh, there's some of the mills that, uh, and I guess it could have been some of my our mill that uh, I didn't don't remember, but they didn't comb the hair, and when they got out from work, they didn't comb the lint out of it, and they uh, go on home, you know, and so they just named them lint heads. <laughs> Probably somebody might have went to town like that sometime. Like, you know, the lint getting in the hair, you know, flying Sick around. Head, yeah. Did, you know what I'm get about? all over you. Did that get you angry to hear people say things oh, like yeah. that? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Will has something smart to say that. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you feel that people looked down on cotton mill people? Um, they did earlier, but in later years, it come to the point when uh, the cotton mill people was the biggest prospects for furniture salesmen, clothing, and cars, and anything you could think of. Well, nobody along there bought a boat. Most everybody has a boat now. Is that right? Now, yeah. Really? Do you have yeah. a boat? No, I, yeah, I got one over at my son's house, but it's not a big boat. I'm talking about, but uh, well, a lot. I just say a lot of people has a boat now, and uh, my son has a pontoon boat, big boat, and uh, the the uh, the lint head. I was there when when they put hose pipes. In the mill, I had a, a engine running, see, to pump air over the mill, so we could we could help, couldn't connect the hose pipe and and blow off. And for some time, they they wouldn't let people do that. They wouldn't. Wouldn't. It was dangerous. But so many of them did it anyway. Until finally, they said, "Well, go ahead and do it." That's what we, we did. Inhaling the air, I guess. Inhaling the air, or it, it had a lot of pressure to it, see. People blow, blow, the whole pipe could uh, uh, blow in certain places on your body, see, could uh, probably blow you up a little bit. And uh, so th they were afraid of that, but people, uh, it never did happen to anybody, not seriously, anyway. And it was, it was a bone, it was just a, a a boon, I guess to say, for people when they got what they could blow off and go home, look clean. Um, I've heard of these songs. This like, cotton mill, hard times, hard times, cotton mill. Is that, do you know what song I'm talking about? There's, what? Do you want to get that? Because I, I spoke a time to it, and nobody had anything. Uh, the people didn't make uh, way back before the NRA and way back before that they didn't make uh, much money what a little bit they made see they would come out just like with cotton all over go to the store and buy something somebody else see or he didn't work he didn't work in that environment see he might have made a little more money than that so that was a lint head just the way they looked at these poor, hard-working people. But these lint heads, they come out of it. And uh, sometimes you see one family or have several people in the family working. Most of them people, they usually got along good because most of them all take that check give them to give them to daddy. And that was fine. If somebody wants some money, Daddy had it. But I don't think he would let them take it and throw it away. 
I don't think he would. Them kind of people always seem to get along good. And uh, some people uh, were just within a man and his wife. Like when I left here one time, my brother got me a job up up uh, from here. But when I come back, I had thirty four to fifty dollars saved in dimes. I could go to a ten cent store and buy me a dime bank, fill it full of dimes, go get another one. So come back down here, my uncle found out about it, and he thought, and he always thought I had half the money I ever made. Uh, but I didn't see. I just <laughs> got, got lucky out there and saved forty fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we couldn't have spent it, but we were trying to save it. Yeah, that, that, did you know that song that I, Hard uh -huh. Time Cotton Mill? Uh -huh. What kind of songs did you all sing together? Did you ever, were there songs about working in the cotton mill that uh -huh. they used to sing around here? Uh, -huh. uh, there was one they used to sing, but I never would, uh, I don't remember now, I don't remember. It was a...